And so I thought, geez, well, now that I started to incorporate more Eastern medicine, why not then use this as another tool? Why does it have to be one or the other? Why can't it be all of these, especially because there is research out there. Welcome to Dog Cancer Answers, where we help you help your dog with cancer. Here's your host, James Jacobson. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the show. Today, we have a special guest, what I'm going to call a unicorn of a veterinarian. I'm genuinely excited for you to meet her. And here's what I mean by unicorn. Imagine a boarded veterinary oncologist who has studied not just Western chemotherapy and radiation and surgery, but has also studied and uses herbs in Chinese traditional medicine. Now imagine that this unicorn vet oncologist is also a proponent of and uses targeted therapies with cannabis as part of her treatment plan for dog cancer, unicorn. That is our guest today, Dr. Trina Haza. She has worn many hats in her life, as you will hear, and this is a delightful conversation that I suspect you'll be thinking about well after this podcast ends. Before we get into it, though, A quick thank you to our sponsor, the best-selling book, The Dog Cancer Survival Guide, full-spectrum treatments to optimize your dog's life quality and longevity by Drs. Damian Dressler and Sue Ettinger. Check it out at your favorite place to buy books or online at dogcancerbook.com. Now let's get into the interview. Dr. Trina Hazard, thank you for being with us today. Thank you for having me. So you are an oncologist in Los Angeles. I know that in general, veterinary oncologists, there are not that many around the world. That is correct. There's probably, God, I would say between four and 500 maybe, at least in the country that I know of. Yeah, there's not that many of us. I'd love to hear why, you know, your journey and then the decision to go into veterinary medicine. And I'm intrigued with why oncology. My family is from Cairo, Egypt. Mm -hmm. I grew up as a first generation in Washington, D.C., and my parents actually, unlike a lot of the family back in Egypt, were very pro-animal. And even my grandmother, who grew up and lived her whole life in Egypt, also loved animals. And she would get these little tortoises and bring them home, and she would name them after all the cities in Egypt. You know, there was one that was Cairo, one that was Alexandria, you know, and so... (laughs) Did you race them? Like, go Cairo. We would just feed them, you know, lettuce or whatever it was. So I grew up in Washington, D.C., and I had begged my parents for a dog, begged them, which I think most kids do, right? Me too. Anyway, so I had begged for this dog. And then eventually, I think it was like 15, I got my first Labrador, and I wanted a yellow lab after Old Yeller my yellow lab named Otis. And he was my absolute everything. I mean, he was my best friend. I did everything with him. And, you know, as a 15 year old, you don't have a lot of money. And so I had to pay for his food and pay for his vet bills. And so what did I do? I started working at the veterinary. Mm. I was like, you know what, let me work at veterinary hospitals because if I work, maybe they'll do his dental for free. You're smart. Okay. Well, I actually only clean cages. That was my job. I cleaned the heck out of those cages and I walked all the dogs. And one day the technician didn't show up and the veterinarian came in the back and said, hey, could you help me do a dental? Could you help me do the surgery? It was a spay. And I was like, I really only know how to clean cages. My job is to clean the cage. I can get my money and pay for my dog's food. And she said, no, 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 just come help me with this. And I said, sure, let's give it a shot. And from that day on, I was helping her with everything. I was helping her with all the surgeries. I was running appointments with her. I mean, I was 15 and a half at this point doing all of this stuff. And I loved it. And it became more than just giving him my dog Otis healthcare. It was like, I actually really loved the medicine of it. And so I just jumped around from vet hospital, worked at emergency hospital, so forth. And then finally, that particular veterinarian that I first started with was like, hey, why don't I just write you a letter of recommendation and you should go to vet school? And I was like, nah, I, you know, my dad told me I was going to be an orthopedic surgeon. So I have to go to medical <laughs> school. And she was like, but do you really want to do that? And I was like, absolutely not. I don't want to touch people. I really just want to hang out with animals. <laughs> She's like, well, then why don't you just do this? And I said, all right, I'll give it a shot. So thank goodness for me, I was able to get into a vet school down in Alabama, a small vet school that she had attended called Tuskegee, mm. which was a historically black university. And the vet school was probably about 50-50, some Caucasian, some African-American. And then there was sprinkles of others, right? There was, you know, some and Puerto quite, I'm Ricans. I'm sure quite a few and, Egyptians, right? Yeah, I, I think I may have been the only one. But it, it was such. <laughs> 
such a great experience because to go from Washington, D.C. metropolitan area to Tuskegee, Alabama, the fact that I can say today it was a great experience. At that time, I was terrified and I couldn't even understand the Southern accent, right? What year is this? This was in 2002. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So essentially, I went to college in Baltimore. I lived with my dog in Baltimore and we lived in actually a not so great area, but it was $50 a month to pay my rent. And so we lived there. We got through college. I went to University of Maryland in Baltimore, then went to Tuskegee. And then during my last year, I remember thinking like, I don't know if I'd be ready to come out of vet school and start practicing right away. Like, did I have enough experience to really do that. It scared me to think I was going to go out and treat animals. It was right before my veterinary board. And one of the instructors said to me, well, why don't you do an internship? And I said, that sounds actually like the best idea. I will not make very much money. But at this point, I was used to not making any money. So what's one more year? Right. right. And clearly you'd learn to be frugal with your $50 <laughs> accommodations in Baltimore. <laughs> exactly. And so uh, I just needed enough to feed the dog, right? And so he was still with me this whole time. And, and so I said, Otis, we're moving. And so right before that year, I took part of the summer to actually go around and visit universities mm -hmm. and figure out, well, if I'm going to do an internship, I got to figure out maybe if there's a specialty I enjoy most, right? And so I went up through kind of the Midwest and started in Tennessee, went through Purdue and Indiana, and then up to Michigan State. Traveled from vet school to vet school with Otis. We were together the whole time in a car with no power steering and no air conditioning in the middle of the summer in the South. I see a theme here going. Anyway, during that time, I got to spend about a month with the oncology service at Tennessee. And I just loved it. Mm. I loved it. The oncology experience was the connection with owners, the science, the medicine behind it. But the connection with the owners was something that I had not experienced with any other specialty. Mm. You really kind of help them through the journey. And the journey is obviously a very difficult journey to find out your best friend, your family member has been diagnosed with cancer. And so they were so supportive of these oncologists and said, hey, why don't you just be an oncologist? And the surgeon was saying, look, you have to complete these surgical requirements. And I said, I hate surgery. I don't even know how to do it. Can I just do oncology? And they were like- This goes back to the first spay when exactly. you were 15 years old. <laughs> I, would, I would rather clean the cage than go in and do <laughs> surgery. And so she was like, you have to complete this until you can finish your internship. So I did it. And then we did a residency, which was an additional three years in oncology, two additional sets of boards. And then after all of that said, where am I going to go? And I thought, if I have to shovel my car one more time, like if I have to deal with walking Otis through the snow, so what was the place that was furthest away that had the sunniest and the best weather? So I moved out to Los Angeles and five years into my stay, at this hospital, I realized that I felt like I wasn't giving everything, right? And that I was only giving this conventional medicine. But quality of life, I felt like I wasn't supporting as much, right? And so I thought, well, because I was a great student, why not go back <laughs> and learn a little bit more? I felt like, well, let's stick with the medicine and go down more the traditional Chinese herbal medicine route. So I did that. And then I honestly became, in my heart, I believe I'm a better doctor. The reason why I felt like I was a better doctor is that I was able to see patients through almost two sets of glasses or two sets of eyes, right? And that I had my conventional Western set of eyes. And then when I wasn't able to succeed, I switched over to my Eastern lens. And then I started to get the skill of combining them. One of my first cases when I started to incorporate Eastern medicine was a very, very sweet beagle mix that came in with transitional cell carcinoma, which is the most common bladder cancer that we see in dogs. And this dog had done fairly well with conventional therapies, received chemotherapy, radiation, did very well, but then developed kidney failure, likely secondary to the disease and the medication that was used to treat the disease. Mm -hmm. So the poor girl was not eating, not doing well, nothing was working. And I said, could you just bring her back in and let me just look at her and feel her pulses and look at her tongue and see. She came in and I said, honestly, it seems like she has a pretty profound yin deficiency. I'm going to go ahead and treat her with herbs. And I want to. All of a sudden you said, I'm going to put on this different lens yes. and now I'm going to look at it through traditional Chinese 
thesis. Yeah, totally. And let me tell you, I had studied it, but I wasn't a believer yet. I had to use it, right? So let me just support your yin and also support your chi. She had GI upset and so forth. So I said, let's just stop all the other stuff. No more Zofran and Serenia and appetite stimulants. She wasn't taking them readily anyway. She kind of hated it. Let's just stop it all. Do me a favor, three days of herbs, because she really thought she was starting to suffer. She wanted to put her down. I said, let's just try three days of herbs and see. I honestly can't tell you if it's going to work. So I started, I think, two different herbs. So let's give this a shot, three days. Day three, she called me and was like, oh my God, she's eating. I was like, what do you mean she's eating? It actually works. And she's like, she's absolutely eating. For, we probably got three months of her doing much better, eating, feeling better. And then she eventually, she came to her disease. Mm-hmm. But it was literally like started it three days later, it worked. And then there was just more cases of these, right, where mm-hmm. conventional had failed. We tried it. And then I said, what am I doing? Why am I waiting for conventional to fail? Okay, so you would start the chemo and also at the same time start the conventional. Tell me about that shift. There were a few others. Like there was one dog that had what they called carcinomatosis. So it was a fluid that had built up in the thoracic cavity and it was all kind of cancer fluid that had developed secondary to a primary lung tumor and nothing was working to kind of help drain the fluid. And I started a, an herb that can help with that. And that started to improve along with a targeted therapy. And so then I think, what well, again, why am I waiting? Why don't I just start it? So this is kind of what I do is I start what I think is going to work the best. So based off of research, based off of my experience, I'll say, what do I think is going to work the best? Is it going to be a conventional modality? Is it going to be an alternative modality? I start that one first. I make sure that the pet tolerates it. No GI upset, doing well. And then gradually I start adding in others. So I might say, hey, I actually think your best bet is a targeted therapy with cannabis. And we'll get into cannabis in a moment. Once I start that, if they're tolerating it, doing well, no vomiting, no diarrhea, Maria, happy, great. You know, we're going to start a Chinese herb. Doing well, let's add in a second one. Let's add in curcumin. But everything is done gradually and partly is because, I don't know, have you taken supplements and herbs Mm -hmm. yourself? Sure. Absolutely. Okay. I'm on what, 20 a day right now, right? I mean, we all are like, we are Chinese herbs, all of us. And what I found with myself is if I just added it all in at the same time, I was sick for a few days. I felt dizzy. I just didn't feel right. And again, I don't think you know until you start it on yourself and you realize, hey, what makes more sense is if I just start them gradually. If one doesn't work well, I'll know if it doesn't work well because I've added it only by itself, Mm -hmm. right? And so that's what I do with all of my patients, which is I know you want to get started. I know you want to throw everything in the kitchen sink. We want to kill this cancer and get rid of it and make your dog feel better. But I actually think that I'm going to make your pet feel worse if I just throw everything. At the same time. Well, talk a little bit about over-supplementation because that's really what you're talking mm-hmm. about is this concept of like more is better and let's just try everything. But it can have some adverse effects. Oh, absolutely. I think there's certain herbs that if you're adding multiple supplements all at the same time, I think the most common thing we see is GI upset, like diarrhea, mm-hmm. vomiting, lethargy. Like those are the three main things that I would believe that I see if I add too many things. But also they may counteract each other. You need to see what you're adding and you need to go to someone that knows what they're doing. Because what I worry a lot is they come to me and they say, oh, I've started this, I've started this, and they've started all these different things. But some of these things have the same exact ingredients in there. And then others, I'm saying, well, why are we adding this and doing this? We're almost counteracting each other. And so really talking to someone through what is the main goal, right, for your pet? Is the main goal to kill the cancer? Is the main goal more like, I think we have a really aggressive cancer. I don't think I can kill it all. I don't think I can put your dog in remission. Maybe it needs to be more palliative in nature. And our goal should be more comfort and quality over quantity. And if that's the case, then let's not go super heavy on these really kind of harsher or heavier herbs because then I'm going to give your dog an upset stomach. They're going to feel dumpy versus if I can support quality then that might be a way to really let's stop these, use these herbs for more quality. There's a time where we can do both. If you have a disease process where I can try to hit the cancer pretty hard and support quality, great, but you can't always do both, especially in a patient that's toward the end and has already been very ill from their disease. And that's where having a really kind of heart-to-heart conversation with a client and saying, where are we at? What are our goals? And I'm here to not just support your pet, but also support you and remind you of the goals that we've set at the beginning. Because many times they will say to me, hey, 
I want to do everything I can, but as soon as they get sick, I just don't want to keep pushing. And I have to be the one at the end to say, remember, we had this conversation. Let's kind of go back to where we were then and make sure we're still on that same path. Or do we need to change that path? Dr. Trina Hassan, let's take a pause right here. Let's take a break. And when we come back, I want to talk more about cannabis and using cannabis as medicine. We'll be right back. As Dr. Trina Hazan knows, there are so many valid options for approaching cancer treatment. And as pet parents, we want to know all about them. And that is where our sponsor comes in, the Dog Cancer Survival Guide, full spectrum treatments to optimize your dog's life quality and longevity. It's authored by Drs. Damian Dressler and Sue Ettinger, who believe that fighting cancer often requires attacking from multiple fronts. These may include conventional treatments like chemotherapy and radiation, alternative methods like nutritional supplements, or a change in diet. If it's been proven to work, they're included in the book. The Dog Cancer Survival Guide is available wherever fine books are sold, both online and in physical bookstores. And you can support this podcast by using a coupon code and getting the Dog Cancer Survival Guide right away direct from the publisher. It's available either in paperback, and there is free shipping to any address in the USA, or as an ebook edition that's under $10. The website to get either the paperback or the ebook is www.dogcancerbook.com, and you will save 10% if you use the promo code PODCAST when you check out. You'll save 10%. The website, dogcancerbook.com, use that promo code PODCAST for 10% off, www.dogcancerbook.com. And now, back to our show with Dr. Hazar. Now let's talk about something that you're really gotten into recently, which is the use of cannabis and specifically cannabis as medicine. Yeah, absolutely. That has, without a doubt, become my passion. While I was studying the traditional Chinese herbal medicine, I started to learn a little bit about cannabis. And I thought to myself, holy moly. This plant is unlike any other plant I have ever read about. It has over 750 compounds. And many of these compounds have potential medicinal benefits. They certainly have several physiologic benefits or physiologic effect. And so I thought, geez, well, now that I started to incorporate more Eastern medicine, why not then use this as another tool? Why does it have to be one or the other? Especially because there is research out there. As a veterinarian in general, as a scientist in general, but specifically as an oncologist, my experience is that onks are so focused on the molecular mechanics of a molecule and what it's going to do. And so that must be ingrained in just the way you approach the world, right? It totally is. It absolutely is. Everything I look at has to have some sort of evidence. Is it preclinical, meaning it was found to be effective for, let's call it pancreatic cancer Mm -hmm. in mouse models? Has it been used in human models? Mm -hmm. And what mechanism does it use to really have that effect? And so a colleague of mine has done that with a lot of the Chinese herbs and looked at the different mechanisms. And I, so I've been using a lot of what she has found for the herbs to figure out, hey, if this pet has this cancer, I'm going to use this herb because it's been found to be effective for this cancer due to this mechanism. Who's that? Uh, do you know Dr. Erin Bannock? No, I think we keep hearing about Dr. Bannock. She's an integrative oncologist. And then Dr. Kendra Pope also is an integrative oncologist. Both of them are pioneers, I would say, mm-hmm. in the integrative oncology realm with Chinese herbs. And okay. Kendra a lot into you know vitamin C and vitamin D and other therapies as well. And then I've really jumped into the more cannabis route. So it's kind of cool because we all have our thing. We all just do something different and we just share with each other what we've learned. Okay. So you started looking at these 700 plus yeah. that are in cannabis. Yep. And I started to look at all of the literature and there are tons, hundreds and hundreds of papers that are published on mechanisms of anti-cancer, anti-seizure, anti-anxiety, cardioprotectant. And does it work in an anti-inflammatory fashion through change and actually the perception of pain, not just CBD, which is one of those molecules, right? Remember we talked about over 700, one is CBD. 700 and people are like, CBD. That's it. Temp oil. Yes, yes, CBD. <laughs> Got it from CBS, right? Like, right. I think Ben and Jerry's has a CBD ice cream that they're coming out with, right? I mean, <laughs> it's the thing, it's the fad, but there's also THC and there's CBDV and there's THCV and there's CBD. I mean, 
there are tons and many of these molecules have potential medicinal effect. And I think if we can understand how each of these work from a molecular fashion, then we find a better way of actually incorporating it into a protocol. Right. So if I know I have a cancer that has a huge inflammatory component, I may want to pick and choose which Western Eastern herbs, which cannabis molecules I want to be added into a formula because I'm looking for a mostly anti-inflammatory effect. Versus if I have a very anxious patient and I'm looking for an anxiolytic effect, I may want to pick and choose which specific compounds have that anxiolytic property, right? So uh, define anxiolytic. Anti-anxiety. Okay. So with all these 700 compounds mm -hmm. in cannabis, CBD is just one of those compounds, but you're saying there are some of these other ones that you can isolate and use therapeutically, and that's what you're doing. Well, so you can isolate for, right? Meaning that I pull out just CBD or so, but... I think at this point where research is, mm -hmm. we don't know enough to say, if I isolate it, what dose do I have to use to create that effect? So my opinion and my recommendation now is to find formulas that have those compounds within them. Okay. Because there is this idea of, I'm sure you've spoken to other people about this entourage effect, mm -hmm. right? Which is essentially the combination of many molecules together. So even if I have a very small amount of what they call a terpene, which is an essential oil found in the plant. That small amount of that terpene could actually work along with, say, a molecule like CBD to make it more effective than just giving CBD by itself. It potentiates it, makes it more powerful and, and able to do what it's supposed to do. Exactly. Which is what? What are these molecules doing for the dog? Well, so it depends on, again, what you need it to do, right? A good example would be my own dog. He has, I would say, significant PTSD from his past. He was mm. found on the street and he is terrified, but he's our dog and we love him. But we had a baby and our baby's 16 months old. And when he was younger and crawling, this didn't work very well. Stanley, our dog, was extremely anxious, and he was starting to give those typical signs when dogs are anxious, giving the side eye, raising the lip, really, you know, starting to displace his anger and his anxiety. And so we were at a point where we were like, geez, are we going to have to get rid of him or give him to someone else? This isn't working. <laughs> so I said, why don't I use cannabis? I talk about it all the time. So I ended up starting a product that was a 30 to one. So that's 30 parts CBD and one part THC. Mm -hmm. And I wanted a little bit of THC, partly because I do think small amounts of THC, I really do think help with anxiety. Mm -hmm. I believe in my heart that CBD by itself, it takes a whole lot of CBD as an isolate to work, where I can use a lot less of a dose if it has a little bit of THC, again, to boost that effect. So this product started a few days later. I'm noticing he is actually letting the kid come around him and rub his belly and he's not growling. And now I literally just today, my child Landon walked right up to him, opened up his lip and I looked at his tooth and Stanley's just sitting there and watching him. Wow. I'm not saying cannabis is it. You have to do behavior modifications. Everything works together in concert, but I did not want to go down the road of Prozac. And not that I judge folks for using it. I would just prefer to use something more natural to start with. And if with behavior modifications and cannabis did the trick, like it, thank goodness, did for our household, we were able to have now a more peaceful household where we're not scared to death that he's going to bite our child. Wow. So what are some of the uses that you do with your oncology patients? Certainly anti-cancer and anti-inflammatory are the big ones. So delve into the anti-cancer. What does sure. that mean? They already got cancer. Is it actually killing the cells? It's twofold. So remember I mentioned it depends on what the goal is. Time is a big factor. Do I have enough time to create an anti-cancer effect? meaning that I'm at the more toward the beginning of the disease process, then yes, I have absolutely seen it. I can pick one in particular that I oftentimes talk about because he was on very little of anything else. So this is a dog, 10 years old, Jack Russell Terrier, that came to me with three different cancers. He had oral squamous cell carcinoma, bladder TCC, and indolent lymphoma. And I always would say to him, his name was Hammer, and he'd come into the hospital as any Jack Russell with tons of energy. And I would be like, 
hammer time and he would jump around. Like, I mean, he just felt so good despite having three cancers. It makes you look at these pets and think, geez, I wish I could have that outlook. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, so anyway, the owner is elected to just remove the squamous cell carcinoma and the bladder cancer, but all was debulking, meaning we left cancer cells behind. It was more just a palliative type, keep them more comfortable, keep them going for a little longer. They knew we weren't able to get all the cancer cells out. They decided they didn't want to do any radiation. They didn't even want to do chemo. They wanted to start what they call a targeted therapy. You know what the targeted therapy is, a therapy. That, but for our listeners. Yep. So a targeted therapy is something that actually targets the growth factor that's telling the cancer to grow. So there are genetic alterations that are within the cancer cells that that create abnormal growth patterns through certain pathways. Okay. Where chemo, remember, kind of targets anything that's rapidly dividing in the body, mm-hmm. where this just targets that genetic alteration. You may have other parts in the body that have abnormal alterations or whatever it may be. So some can be very targeted just for the one, and some are what they call dirty targeted therapies. And that means it can actually target some other areas as well. And those are pharmaceuticals? One is FDA approved for animals and it's called Palladia. And we've had that for God over 10 years now. And then there's a company out there called Phytocure that is actually looking at the genetic profile of every individual tumor. And they are looking at FDA approved drugs in humans to target those in animals. But they've not been FDA approved in animals. So you're trying targeted therapy with this uh, Jack JRT. Yep. So we started that. So we got six months of control. He was doing well. But after six months, this tumor was so large, it caused facial deformity. It crawled all the way up toward his eye where he was unable to see from his eye. He had headaches. I mean, you could just tell he was really uncomfortable. Owners came to me and said, what are we going to do? And I said, well, we could do radiation. We could try some alternative medicine if you guys are open. And why don't we try cannabis? And that's exactly what we did. And then we started what they call a one-to-one, meaning one part CBD, one part THC at a fairly low dose. And he just maintained that dose. And after it was one milligram of each compound. After, I would say, weeks, the owner started to say, hey, I think it's getting smaller. Mind you, we did nothing else. He stayed on the Palladia. We knew we had progressive disease, started nothing except this cannabis. So we've literally done nothing else. The owner said, I think it's starting to get smaller. And I said, no way. Kind of like what I said the first time I started the Chinese. No way. The owner called me and said, yeah, I'm telling you, it's getting smaller. I said, bring them in. So two months, three months later, he brought the dog in. I couldn't find the tumor. You couldn't find it. One of the distinctions that I've gotten over the years about oncologists is, please correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. An oncologist defines success in oncology as reducing the rate at which a cancer cell grows. This is the thing that like blows my mind, that success in oncology is, well, it's not growing as fast uh, as it was growing before. Right. Slowing down growth is absolutely considered success depending on the type of tumor. Because some tumors are so difficult to treat that if we're able to slow it down and we have even what we consider stable disease, mm-hmm. we have a party about that sometimes. Right. Absolutely. Right. Well, then when you saw on this JRT, would you define it as remission? You couldn't find tumor. I would have said a clinical remission. And that I remember looking at the back of his mouth and I was like, I mean, I see a little red, but it was a mass that was taking up half his face. I mean, it could have honestly just been an inflammatory part in the back. There was not a mass anymore. So I was like, well, you convinced me and everyone else. I did nothing else. And I kept asking him, are you sure? Did you not add something else also? And he's like, I promise this is all we did. He went home two months after, I believe. The owner forgot to refill the cannabis. Mm. Two weeks passed without cannabis. The tumor started to come back. Mm. And then I said, let's double the dose and see what happens. I couldn't slow it down anymore. And then he ended up getting some palliative radiation to keep him comfortable. And then he was put to sleep a few months after. Mm. I usually say when it comes to dosing cannabis, that has become a very confusing topic for a lot of veterinarians. And my theory with that is... Because cannabis is dosed in what they call a biphasic fashion, meaning that sometimes the lowest dose can have an opposite effect as the highest dose. A good example would be like CBD. At a very low dose, it can actually be fairly stimulating. At a high dose, it can actually be very sedating. How do you know? If you overshoot it, then you're in a place where your dog's sedated and not doing well and it's not even working. You can actually 
get worsening of an effect. So a good example would be pain. Sometimes too much cannabis can make your pain worse. So how do you figure it all of it out? It's as easy as just knowing you gradually titrate or increase the dose. And every dog, just like every person, has its own internal endocannabinoid system. We all have a unique system. My system is so different than your system. It's like how much caffeine you can tolerate. Some people go exactly. or alcohol, berserk with right? more alcohol. Right? Yeah. It's based off of your genetics a lot of the times, right? And mm -hmm. there's no difference with this. And so how do you know what your dog is going to need? It's not going to be the same as your neighbor's dog. I always recommend starting low, increasing the dose slowly. And when you find the dose, whatever effect you're looking for, anxiolytic, again, reduction in anxiety, anti-seizure, anti-cancer, anti-pain, you find where your dog is now more comfortable. Seizures are reduced. Whatever it is, you stop it there. You don't go beyond that. So for the cancer, I would say once your dog is in remission, you stop. Don't keep going because maybe we're going to end up getting negative effects. Mm -hmm. And we just have found the dose that's working. So that has been my kind of my learning curve, right? Figuring out what works. And that has been the most successful strategy, in my opinion. Is this at this current point more art than science? With almost any chemo drug, you can go to your database and look up. This is more of an art, it sounds like. I think because we have a little bit less research, right? I still try to teach my resident all the time, even with these chemo protocols. Chop is chop, but you can make chop fancy if you want to make it, right? You can change drugs up. You got to look at the patient and figure out what the patient actually needs, right? And and that's what I think does make oncology more interesting and in that every patient isn't the same. And you can change protocols and so forth. But with cannabis, because there is a certainly less research, I change it based off of how they're tolerating it and how they're responding and so forth. So absolutely. I think medicine in general, honestly, is an art and cannabis medicine is not very different. Down the road, I think as we get more and more information and genetic profiling is done on individuals and so forth, we may be able to start to figure out certain compounds could work either individually or in combination with just a few others versus having to get the entire plant involved. Now, as a board of oncologist, you have to do continuing education. You attend conferences with other oncologists, right? I do. How does that go? No, I think things have changed a lot. It used to be kind of the joke where it was like, is this just snake oil? And now they're getting owners that are asking them every single day, hey, my brother-in-law had this cancer. They only did cannabis and it worked. So why can't I do it in my dog? And then the oncologist is saying, oof, I only know the conventional therapy is but I don't want to leave you hanging. So how can I get more information? So you're starting to find oncologists looking and searching for more information so they can be more knowledgeable on the topic. And that's where I, I'd like to say I can come in and help with that. And we just published a paper. It's a 42-page review paper on cannabis and veterinary medicine that will hopefully be able to give some folks uh, veterinarians guidance and give them a little bit more factual data as well. Can we post a link to that? It's actually in the process of being published now. It will be published by, I believe it's mid-December. Okay. So it will be an early holiday gift for everyone. Send it to us. We will put a link in the show notes for today's episode. So if you want to read this. Now, in terms of educating people and vets in general, you've been important in putting together specific veterinary medical associations focused on cannabis. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. It's a, a society. It's a nonprofit 501c3 that we've just started to put together in this last year called Veterinary Cannabis Society. And the real goal of this society is to try to support everyone that's confused right now. And then when I say everyone, there's three main pillars. It's going to be the veterinary profession, veterinarians, veterinary technicians, office staff, the actual pet parents themselves that are struggling to find which is the best product, which is the safest product for my pet. I mean, that's the scary thing is there's so much stuff out there. Can I have guidance as to how to figure out which is the safest one? And then lastly, the third pillar really is the companies, the manufacturers that are making these products. We need to give them guidance to make sure that they are making safe products for pets. And pets are not human beings. They can get toxicity with certain substances that humans can take readily and have no issues with. And so the education is a huge part of what Veterinary Cannabis Society brings 
also the advocacy, being able to support veterinarians and say, hey, it's unfair that you are terrified that you're going to lose your veterinary license over guiding a pet parent on finding a safe product. They would be lost without us. They come to us and trust us. And if the veterinary medical boards aren't able to support us, we need to go and speak to these veterinary medical boards and really support veterinarians. This society is here to provide advocacy for veterinarians so we can make sure veterinarians don't feel that they're gagged and masked. And what about the government regulatory thing that makes the individual state vet boards so nervous? Because I mean, we've had vets on this show who, like, I can only basically talk about it. I can't recommend it. From a federal standpoint, we are working with other organizations that are speaking with the folks in the federal government to say, hey, look, what letters can we write to support Mm. the ability for veterinarians to at least be on the same stage as human physicians? That's all we're asking. Human physicians are able to write recommendations in many states for medical cannabis. Why should we not be able to do that? And so we continue to collaborate with organizations that are actually writing legislative agendas and so forth to federal governments, supporting the idea that veterinarians need to be on that same platform. Hey, this may go back to your roots in Washington, D.C. growing up as a kid. Can you imagine? Yep, I I show back up. Remember me. (laughs) (laughs) Dr. Trina Hazah, thank you so much. This has been an absolute delight, and I really enjoyed speaking with you. Hopefully, we'll get to do this again in the future. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll just put in the plug, please visit vcs.pet. So vcs.pet is the website for Veterinary Cannabis Society please join. We're going to have memberships open starting January 1st, but we are certainly looking for donations to help support all the education and advocacy pieces. Awesome. And so that's not just for veterinarians, dog lovers, please. pet lovers can yes. be a part of that That's too. a huge okay. part of what we're doing. Thank you. We'll post a link in the show notes again, Dr. Trina. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me. It's been my pleasure. Well, there you have it, a veterinary oncologist unicorn. Please let me know if you agree, because we do want to hear from you. In fact, you know, we have a whole team of people who put dog cancer answers together, and we would love to hear from you. You can reach out to us via social media or on our website at dogcanceranswers.com, where we have all the links and, of course, the show notes to today's episode. The website is a great place to listen to any of our previous episodes, including the show with the other co-founder of the Veterinary Cannabis Society, Dr. Gary Richter. He was our guest a number of weeks ago. I want to let you know about an amazing resource that we don't talk about much, but you should be taking advantage of. It's called Dog Cancer News, and it is a weekly newsletter put out by the editorial team at Dog Cancer Blog. Every week, the newsletter delivers useful information and articles, and sometimes even recipes and updates on new developments. It's all designed to help you better care for your dog with cancer. The newsletter is free, and you can subscribe to it at dogcancernews.com. The website is dogcancernews.com, and subscribe for free today. Ah, those touch tones, they remind me to remind you that veterinarians are on call on our listener line. If you have a question for a dog cancer vet, please call our listener line and tell us all about it. We'll send it to one of our veterinary experts, and after that, your question and the answer will appear on a future episode of Dog Cancer Answers. The phone number is 808-868-3200. That number is available 24 hours, seven days a week because it's a recorded line. 808-868-3200 or visit our website at dogcanceranswers.com We'd like to once again thank our sponsor The Dog Cancer Survival Guide Book by Damian Dressler and Sue Ettinger It's available both online and in brick and mortar stores and remember, getting the book also helps to support this podcast when you get it directly from the publisher via the website at dogcancerbook.com and use the promo code podcast for 10% off. That is www.dogcancerbook.com. Again, our heartfelt thanks to Dr. Trina Hazaw for joining us today. Until next time, I'm James Jacobson from all of us here at Dog Cancer Answers and Dog Podcast Network. I wish you and your dog a warm aloha. 
Thank you for listening to Dog Cancer Answers. If you'd like to connect, please visit our website at dogcanceranswers.com or call our listener line at 808-868-3200. And here's a friendly reminder that you probably already know. This podcast is provided for informational and educational purposes only. It's not meant to take the place of the advice you receive from your dog's veterinarian. Only veterinarians who examine your dog can give you veterinary advice or diagnose your dog's medical condition. Your reliance on the information you hear on this podcast is solely at your own risk. If your dog has a specific health problem, contact your veterinarian. Also, please keep in mind that veterinary information can change rapidly. Therefore, some information may be out of date. Dog Cancer Answers is a presentation of Maui Media in association with Dog Podcast Network. 